So glad to be in again this morning. Uh, I was just thinking of how that this snow, now if we were in Colorado, this snow would be real uh, soft and fluffy and be about 40 below zero and you could blow like that and go plumb down to the dust. And it'd be like that all winter long. But now it's here in this uh, all kind of a twix between zone. Now it gets real wet and sloshy and bad. And it just looks like it. I, I wish I could just fly away over in Arizona and wait till the spring come and then come back. Amen. That's how we all have colds, the germs and things. Now I just lay on the ground and it'll freeze and then thaw and then freeze and then thaw. And that... It comes up and we breathe that in and get sore throats, headaches, and aches and pains. <laughs> my, my, what a time. What a place. But there's a land beyond the river Amen. that they call that sweet forever. Amen. And we only reach that shore by faith degree. One by one we gain that portal there to dwell with the immortal. Amen. Someday they'll ring those golden bells for you and me. That's where we go home to stay then, isn't it? That's the day we're looking for. Now, last night I certainly enjoyed those wonderful sermons and things that I heard from my brethren. Where's Pat Tyler? Is he in this morning? Pat? Oh, I didn't see you sitting right there, big as life and twice as natural and... And I, I didn't uh, see you sitting there. First time I ever had Pat, heard Pat speak. I certainly enjoyed that. I'm sure we all did. Amen. And then the little brother gave that fiery testimony of a sermon here that really did sound like a machine gun firing. Amen. Some brother, I met him in Ohio. Is he here this morning? Somewhere, Brother Neville remarked about him being so rapidly firing. And then Brother J.T. Pornell and... and uh, I think they never did get the Brother Beeler. And is he Brother Parnell here? Brother Parnell? Brother Beeler? I'm not sure. I thought I'd seen Brother Beeler. These lights, this is uh, when they build a new tabernacle, I hope that they fix the thing different, a little different. This is our first one, experimental. <laughs> and so we ever get a new one, why, uh, we want a little different from this. You can't see. I like for a tabernacle to be built kind of slanting down like this, the audience. You're looking right straight into your audience all the time. And then especially in the discernment meetings, you can just go right around. So you pick them right around like this, right back and forth. And then even if you have to have a small balcony to come out, it's better. Brother Littlefield, if Billy's here, called me last night, and he's sending the descriptions of that tabernacle I dedicated there, which the architect's... Brother Woods, it cost, I believe, $500 just for the architect to draw it up. And uh, he um, he's sending that with the price and everything of all the material and ever to before and so by so that goes in it. And um, he's sending it to us and wants to come and said he'll go to the lumber people and so forth and see if he can't get them to make a, a cut like he did on his. Beautiful tabernacle, not very big, but it's. A beautiful structure. So I told him, I said, I, I will give that to the trustees and deacons as soon as you send to Billy. And, and then we'll um, let them see what the appropriation, how much they have to have to start their building. He said, when you do, I'm coming and put on a pair of overhauls and just stay right with you during that time. And Brother Littlefield is such a graceful man. Gracious man. Very fine. Now... Are you all feeling right up to it to start the new year now? Yeah. Amen. Go all right out the new year. We're going to start it off right, serving the Lord. How many Amen. got up this morning and thanked Him for the old year and what all it meant and asked Amen. Him to forget the back? So we did it at the bedside when we got up and then come into the table and we're usually a little family all are together around the table and praying. And so uh, we always try to make it a habit of praying of a night before we go to bed. I have that since I was a... First converted, I get up of a morning and it's too dark, too misty for me to walk. I, I don't know where I'm going. But if I just ask him to take my hand and guide me through the day. Then I Amen. remember right across the street here when I was just 
a young man, Billy Paul, was about three years old or four, and we lived just across the street. And one night, he won't drink of water, and he was out in the kitchen, a dipper in a bucket. And I said, uh, oh, I was so tired. I worked hard all day and preached half the night. And, and he said, Daddy, I, I want a drink. And I said, uh, uh, Billy, uh, 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 just uh, go right into the kitchen there. It's on a little table. And I said, he got up, rubbed his eyes, and looked through there. He said, Daddy, I'm afraid to go. <laughs> and I said, well, that's, uh, that's all right. I said, uh, just run on, honey, and get a drink. Daddy is so tired, just a little distance about that window. And he, he said, but I'm afraid to go, Daddy. Well, I got up to the little fellow and reached over and got a hold of my hand. And it's a good thing. We had to walk four or five steps till he hit a rug where a media waxed the floor and on a piece of linoleum. And you know how that is. And he just made a scoop, but I had his hand. And then he just squeezed me that much tighter. And then I stood there a little bit and I thought, God, that's right. See? I don't want to make one step without you hold my hand because I don't know when I'm going to slide. You see? And as long as I can feel your big, powerful hand grip mine, I know you'll hold me up in the times of my... So I, I try to make a habit of that to, to keep uh, my hand in his. And sometimes I've done things that seem ridiculous in my own sight, uh, such things that seem so unnatural to the human mind. But if we just let it alone, I find out it was the only thing that could be done to be right. You know, things that don't look right here, if God leads you into them, they'll be right out here somewhere, you see, because he knows how to lead so seeing it is our all-sufficient grace and all that we have need of or care for is in Him. Then let's lay aside everything else besides Him and hold to God's unchanging hand. We used to sing a song here. I haven't heard it sang in a long time. Now, I can't sing and there's, I don't think there's any strangers with us. So uh, I, that's the reason I try these little songs, you know, because I just love it. And Gene, if you let this go through that tape out in the public, <laughs> used to sing a little song here, time is filled with Swiss translations, naught on earth a move, a move can stand, build your hopes on things eternal, hold to God's unchanging hand. How many of you have heard the song? <clears throat> oh, I love it, don't you? Let's try the verse of it. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Let's try a verse. When our journey is completed, into God we have been true. Fair and bright your home in glory. Your enraptured soul shall view. God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Let's stand now just a minute for prayer, if you will. While we raise one of our hands to God and sing that again. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold unchanging hand mm, but not this world's vain riches that 
so rapidly decay. Build your hopes on things eternal. They will never pass away. Heavenly Father, as we stand, Lord, I just love to sing those old songs. They go way down deep into the inner parts of our heart and bring out the expression of our love to Thee, the living God. And as we raised our hands, Lord, this morning it was a little memorial that hold our hands, Lord. I was just telling about Billy Paul, how that he gripped on to my hand. He would have fell if it hadn't been I was holding him. And oh God, how many... Times would have we have fallen if you hadn't held our hand. Thinking how he with no mother is a little baby and how that how down through life that the roads that he had taken would have been killed long ago, but there was a great hand that could reach out where mine couldn't reach and take a hold. I were so grateful for that. So glad to know, Lord, that when we feel our soul separating from this body, that there's still a hand that we can reach out and take a hold that will guide us over the river. We thank Thee for these things. This assurance, this blessful assurance that we have, an anchor of the soul that keeps us steady while we're walking over this journey, our sailing life solemn main. And we pray, Father, that as the poet said, the forlong and a shipwrecked brother, seeing our steadiness on keel, seeing it shall take heart again or take courage again and try again. Know that the all-sufficient God, if we stumble or fall, His great hand is there to help us. His grace is sufficient. Now we pray, God, that we will this morning start the new year off and hymns and singing and rejoicing and knowing that God will guide us down through life's journey and over the river of death into that promised land. Our eyes look beyond Jordan's swelling streams this morning, the where the fields of, of clover and the fields of evergreen is growing, and we pray, God, that our souls will catch that vision and never let it loose. Someday when we have to come down to that stream where she crosses, that like Elijah of old, the robe of God will smite death streams and we'll walk over without a fear. Grant it, Lord. Help us as we approach thy word. Oh, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will anoint these words. We are certainly insufficient to teach them. Not being a teacher... We know that the only way that we'll be able to know it is for that great master teacher to come and take his, his place of abode in our hearts and, and overpower our minds in such a way in our thoughts till we'll, he'll interpret the Holy Scriptures to us. Hallelujah. We're solemnly depending on that. And think of it, God. Oh, how wonderful that a living father like that, that was from, that's the very birth of eternity, that would come down to immortal beings and help us and would bring his word and give it in our mouths and hearts and ears that we might hear it and live to redeem us from a curse that we had nothing to do with it coming, Father, because it was done by the human race and we're the offsprings of that, that first couple. And we are born in sin, shaped in iniquity. But a just and living God knows that we had nothing to do with that, but has made a way of escape and give us the privilege of coming. How glad we are we've come to Father's house. We pray now that you'll bless our church here, Brother Neville, our, our gallant pastor, your humble servant. We pray for our deacons and our trustees that you'll give them the greatest year that they've had. Grant it, Lord. Give them long life. Strengthen them, Lord. They're your servants. May they always stay gallant at the post of duty. Bless the laity, the, the members, your dear beloved children It comes to this house. God, we claim the soul of every one of them that crosses the threshold of this house. We claim it for you, Lord. 
Help us to be such ministers that will bring the word so simple and so true by the Holy Spirit that they'll long to be like you, Lord. Grant it. Heal the sick and afflicted that comes in. And all around the world, grant it in every house of God. Finally, when you're finished, Lord, may we enter into thy portals, sit down at the welcome table of God, and eat and live together through ceaseless ages. Until then, may we have health and strength, happiness, joy, power, and might, and the blessings of the Holy Spirit to guide us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I appreciate that fine musical this morning that I just got in time talking to my good friend Brother Skaggs and and Brother Gene back there and a, another brother at uh, the door. At, uh, I just got to hear part of it. But it was coming in on the recorder. Very beautiful. Amen. How y'all enjoying Revelations? All right. I believe a whole lot like my little girl Sarah back there has become revolutions to me. <laughs> it's, hey, hey, it's just revolutions <coughs> going over and over. You know, I wish we just had now until about March or April just to put a great big canvas across the back here and just come down in daytime and draw out those pictures and the whole chart and just raise them up and down like window shades, you know, like I've always dreamed sometime of having a great big tabernacle somewhere where I could reach down and pull this chart down, come all the way across the platform and the revelations and the interpretations the Lord has given me and take a pointer and start through there and bring these ages down. And when you get through with that, raise that one up, pull the other one down like this and start on that and teach it Amen. through. Oh, that would just be a, like a little heaven, wouldn't it? Just set Amen. the complete winter through. Just Amen. set it out with the Lord. Praise God. So good to be alone with Him. You know, we used to sing a song, There are times I like to be all alone with Christ my Lord. I can tell Him all my troubles all alone. See, that's the way to get. Amen. Used to sing, Roy Davis used to sing a little song, Steal Away and Pray with Jesus. Pray. Everything is points, everything you look at always falls right back in the line of Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Yes. Sir. Now, on the church ages that we talked of last eight days in the meeting, then last night, I think we got to the second verse of the fourth chapter of the Revelation. And I suppose all of you were here last night to, to get it. And so I, maybe if I get down a verse or two of it this morning, and, or how far the Lord will lead, I don't know. I've got down to about the sixth or seventh verse here, just a little context row down where I can go back in different parts of the Scriptures and pull out those things and um, where I studied yesterday. And now we find out, we left off last night, I believe, at the second verse, beginning on the third, I think it was. And we just left off with the voice of the trumpet. Was that right? The sounding of the voice. Let me read it all so we get back now. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it was of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And he that sat on the throne, he that sat was to look, upon like jasper and sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around about the throne in the likeness of an emerald. Now, this beautiful, all oh, beautiful lesson. And this morning, just before I was coming down, I got down here into the sixth verse. I don't know, my, I can't get it past that. Because here's something in this sixth verse I want all the peoples to hear real well when we get to these beasts. The different definitions of these beasts here, looking back into the original, one is a one kind of a beast and the other four beasts is another. One is an animal. In the Greek, like wild animal, this other is not translated right in the King James. 
for it isn't beast, it's living creatures. And how those creatures, what they were, it wasn't human, neither was it angel. So it's living creatures and how they had four faces and four, oh my, we bring that right down to the gospel and bring it right back and place it today, just as perfect as it did. And remember, four is an earthly number, see? And it's just a beautiful lesson there. And so I, I'm pretty sure we won't get down into that. Uh, maybe we will. But it's so wonderful. Then, if the Lord willing, then if we're around, maybe next Sunday we may try that again. Try it uh, down, see if we can finish up this fourth chapter before we get away. We don't know exactly yet where the first start will be. Now we find that after, after these things, after meant that after the church ages had ceased, then John was summoned to come up higher, come up hither, which means come up here. Uh, he showed him all that was going to happen in the world about the church age. Then after the church ages is over, we find then that John was a type of ever true believer that will be summoned by Christ on high. Is that right? Summons, come up hither. And we find out that the voice that spoke to him was the voice of a trumpet, clear, distinctly. And it was the same voice that spoke to him here on earth. See, as long as he was in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, he was speaking to or from. Oh, I like that. Speaking from the candlesticks. See, he was in the candlesticks speaking from them to his church. Then when the church age had ceased, he left the earth and moved up into the heavens and called his redeemed up with him. Amen. Oh, isn't that beautiful? I, I, oh, it just makes my heart jump. And remember, as we bring these things, I want especially young converts like Sister Ina here, and uh, Ina rather, and her husband and Rodney and, and his wife and Charlie and them to understand that these things and many of you young people that just come into the Lord that hasn't went very far down the line yet, just tasted it and seen that He's good and gracious. Now, Notice this, that these things that we're speaking, what we're trying to do is settle your faith. That when God says anything, it's got to happen. Amen. It just simply won't fail. No matter, it may look like it's a million miles and never can happen, but God will move it right around Amen. and make it happen. Amen. And He does that to test you. Look what He said to Abraham. Take your son up here on top of the hill and kill him. After he waited for him for 25 years. And he said, take him up here and kill him. How? I'm going to make you a father of nations. And Abraham, 100 years old. His wife, 90. And their only child, Abraham's about 115 then. So he said, how is he going to be? How, how can it be? If me, an old man as old as I am, and waited for 25 years, you give me the promise of 75 and here I am 100 and Sarah was 65, and now she's 90. How, after we've had this baby, and you told me way back there, 25 years ago when I was 75 years old, I was going to have the baby. After living with Sarah all these years, I was sterile and she was unfertile. So then, how, yet you made me uh, fertile and made her fertile, and then come along and give us this baby, and we've raised him up here to 15 years old, and through this child you said you'd bless the Gentiles and every nation in the world. And make me a father even of the Gentiles. Make me a father that in the ages it is to come, Lord. That you make me a father of every nation under the heavens. Through this child, and through this child, there come a redeemer. And through that redeemer would redeem the whole human race. Amen. How are you going to do it, Lord? That wasn't Abraham's thought. That wasn't Abraham's question. Obedience. Amen. Didn't say how are you going to do it, it's none of my business. Amen. You said it, so I know your word's right. If you can keep your word for me and can show me that when I was 75 years old, when you called me and said, separate yourself and journey into a strange land, I've been in this land for 25 years, left an old man, living with a wife that I've lived with since she was a girl, a half-sister. And then uh, all this time, and you give me this baby that you promised, I received him as one from the dead. Amen. 
And if you say kill him, you're able to raise him up from the dead again. Amen. Oh my. Amen. That's the way. That's it. And he did. Amen. And as soon as he obeyed God in fullness, raked Isaac's hair from his face, pulled out the lance to kill him, his own son, his only begotten son, God was showing a pattern, showing us. What did he do that for? He didn't have to. But he did it so that you and I, that we might look up on these things in this dark, dreadful day where man's hearts are so filled with evil, Amen. that we might know that God keeps his promise. Amen. No matter how insufficient it seems Amen. to be, how impossible it might be, God still remains God Amen. and he keeps every promise that he made. Amen. That's what I'm trying to say to you when we stand here in a healing service. Amen. Stand here and say, I'm sick. You, that's no doubt. You are sick. But God keeps His promise. Amen. Then He'll come down. Now see, He made an atonement here that He that He would heal you. That's what He's done. Now the only thing He asked you to do is believe that. Yeah. Hold to it. It's like Abraham did. Well, the doctor says, I, I'll live one more day. I don't care. That's fine. That's all a man knows. That's the best that he knows. How's Abraham going to receive this child after already laying him up here and the word of God told him to go kill the boy? Amen. How's he going to do it? That's not the question. God said do it and that settles it. Amen. How am I going to get well and the doctor says that I can't get well? Uh, so it might be the question is take God's word. And as soon as that's revealed to you that you're going to be well, then you, you just remember you're going to be well. There is nothing Amen. can keep you from it. Amen. That's right. Amen. So, when Abraham, fully in obedience, how is he going to do it? The last moment, last five minutes come, the last three minutes, last two minutes, last one minute, last 30 seconds, last second come. When the hand was already up to take the boy's life, God said, stop it right there. Amen. Stop it right there. See, I see that you really trust me. i just done this, Abraham, to show... The Branham Tabernacle in days to come, see? Amen. What's going on? That they must trust me. Amen. They mustn't doubt me at all. Trust me. Just about that time, he, here was a sacrifice. He never made it in vain. No, he never did it in vain. For just then a, a lamb bladed, a little ram, had been hooked in the wilderness there by the horns. And how many times we went through that? How did that ram get there? How, through all them wild animals, a hundred miles from civilization, amongst lions, jackals, wolves, every kind of a wild animal back in there, way up on top of the mountain where there's no water in the grass. What was it doing there? God created it. Amen. Just placed it there. And to see him in our days that we're living in. Now this morning I'm going to have to do a whole lot of uh, personal things to say it, to get what I want to say. That's why I'm back in this way I am for starting on this. I want you to understand that these things that sound personal, they are not meant personal. They're only brought in to give an example to you that your faith might rest solemnly in the faith that's in Christ. Amen. You might rest upon His promise because God keeps His promise. This is perfect as it can be. Amen. Now, showing to us, and look at that same Jehovah Jireh, which Abraham called him, which in the Hebrew means God will provide for himself a sacrifice. God can do that. He made his way. If he said, uh, he told Noah, he said, well, I was just Abraham. No, he told all down through the age and he's still telling. Amen. He said to Noah, back there as we're getting into this morning, uh, let's go to rain. Why, there was, never was a cloud in the sky. The biggest stream of water was a branch. Where God irrigated the land, a little spring somewhere. That's the biggest stream of water there was. Now people say, how in the world is there going to come any water down from up there? Show me where it's at, up there in all that hot sun. If there ain't any up there, if God said build an ark and it's coming, it's my business to build the ark and get ready because it's coming. Amen. He's Jehovah Jireh. He can provide water up there. Amen. And the only thing he done was let man, foolish, silly man, do exactly with his science to bring to pass of what he know would come. God never destroyed the world. Man destroys the world. God don't destroy nothing. God tries to preserve everything. Man destroys himself by his knowledge. Like he did in the Garden of Eden at the tree, so forth. And so some fanatic got a hold of some atomic power somewhere that they had it, they, they could work with it then. 
Because they could do things then with it that we have never learned yet. We are not that far advanced. Maybe take three or four years yet or more before we can do it. To do what they did. They built the pyramids and the sphinx and so forth. We can never do that. We couldn't reproduce that. There's no way for us to do it. Only unless we can get a, an atomic power. Gasoline power, electric power wouldn't lift one of them. Boulders wouldn't move it off the ground. And some of them are city block high up in the air, weighing a billion tons. How'd they get them up there? See, they know. And they let that loose. Somebody let one of them atomic bombs fly into the screen of some others back in the days. Because as it was in the days of Noah, as it was, that kind of a civilization, that kind of a smart people, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. A repeat of what it was. Amen. See? Here not long ago, they dug up a modern waterworks it was down, down here in Mexico before the Antiluvian flood. You see this in the paper? Right? A modern waterworks, just like we have now, had sunk so far beneath the ground, some atomic something covered it over. She just blew up and went over like that. See? Now, as it was in the days of Noah, smart man, Smart man with their atomic powers and everything could build pyramids and sphinx and so forth. As it was in that day, so will it be. But the work's to be cut short in this day because there's to be a raptured people taken out. Like Enoch, there's to be a people carried over. We're in that class this morning. The people is carried over like Noah was to the flood. But remember, before, don't forget this, before one drop of rain fell before there was one thing in the sky before Noah ever ever had the ark completed Enoch was taken home Amen. Amen. Enoch was raptured without death he started walking one day and, and he, gravitation lost its hold on him and he found one foot a little higher and another foot a little higher and another foot a little higher and the first thing you know he said farewell world just walk on up into glory <laughs> and when Noah looked around and couldn't find Enoch anywhere he looked around, he didn't know where Enoch went. Then he says, time to get to building the ark now. <laughs> they went to work on the ark to carry over the remnant. That's the same thing that takes place right here. The church was taken up into heaven. And John now is brought up with it as a type of the resurrected, as we took it last night, and find out that this same voice that summons him to look back on earth was the same voice that summons them to come up. Amen. Amen. Oh, every Christian, Hallelujah. the very voice, Charlie, that summons you one day down there in Kentucky to turn around is the same voice that will summon you to come up. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that, Brother Evans? Amen. The voice that said, turn around. Amen. The same voice that come up. Oh my! There, what a summons! What a reality, clear, distinct, like a trumpet. Turn around, serve me. Come up where I am. There we seen him represented those who died. Moses to represent the dead saints. Rose Elijah with his group at the last day. With his rapture group standing there. All before the Lord Jesus. John revealed that Jesus told him that he would not die. And what was it to them? If he would live until he seen his coming. And the disciples put a saying out. Oh, I wish I could get real, real dean right now for a few minutes to the church. Everyone knows that everyone lives a, a private life with God. It's an individual affair. Things of the Spirit that carries you into places you'd be daring to even speak of it. I've noticed this in my own little humble ministry that there's many times that I'll say something and not know why I said it and it don't look right, but yet somebody will say something, but I'll watch and that thing will come just as perfect around to that as it can come. Amen. God will make it happen. When I just want to say something, I'll say, well, wait a minute. That guy, so-and-so, this happened over here, now that, that just has to be that way. Well, really, I, I don't know why I said it. And the first thing you know, it's just that way. Amen. God does it. Now, when these disciples had said, 
Oh, Jesus said this man wouldn't die. Jesus never said that. Jesus said, what is it to you if he lives till I come? But to see the disciples making a saying of it, then Jesus reached down and took John and brought him up and let him rehearse the whole thing. Amen. See the rehearsal of the coming of the Lord. John seen the church. He seen the end of the church age. He saw the end of the Jews. He saw the second coming. He saw all the order. And look what God had to do. Bore him in Greece for about 24 hours down there to let him see that he was divine. Amen. That the divine spirit had anointed the, the soulish, the outside soulish, or whatever you call it, the human flesh had so divinely impressed it till hot burning grease for 24 hours didn't even scorch him. Trying to borrow the Holy Spirit out of a man. Can't do that. They put him out on the Isle of Patmos and he wrote the book and come back and preach several years. <laughs> of course, now he had to pack a bad name. He was a fortune teller. He was a witch. How many knows that John was called a witch? Absolutely. Jesus is called one too. See? See? The world don't know nothing about these things. He was a mind reader. See? They said that he was such a witch that he bewitched that grease. That the grease couldn't burn him because he bewitched it. <laughs> Just because he didn't agree with their Catholic ideas. Amen. That was all. He was a servant of God that humble, had a little mission down there that he kept. He wouldn't uh, uh, tolerate with them big old things and so... God just kept him and preserved him. So Amen. did he, St. Martin and, uh, and Irenaeus and all down through the age. And he's doing the same thing today. Amen. Coming right on down. Amen. Amen. Now don't never forget this. That God promised great shakings and great mighty works. Uh, write this on your notes that you're writing. See? see, That what man calls mighty and great God calls foolish. Amen. And what man calls foolish, God calls great. Amen. Don't forget that. See, don't forget it. That'll help you along in the years to come. Because we're looking for something greater all the time. And we're receiving greater all the time. But the peoples of the world don't know it. Amen. Neither did they know it in the days of Noah. Amen. Neither did they know it in the days of John. In the days of Jesus. In the days of the apostles. In the days of Arrhenius. Yeah. Any of those days, they never knew it. Amen. Even Joan of Arc, she was a sainted little woman when she was nothing but a girl. God spoke to her in visions and an angel talked to her. You know what the Catholic Church said? She's a witch. And they put her on a stake and burned her to death. The Catholic priest did. Killed her, sentenced her to death as a witch. And Joan of Arc died as a witch. About 200 years later, they found out she wasn't a witch. She was a, a disciple of Christ. They did the same thing to all the saints. Amen. Jesus said, which one of you, your fathers, didn't persecute? Amen. Which one of the prophets ever come that they didn't refuse? Amen. Said, you whited wall. Said, you, you go down and, and put the garnish on top of the prophets' tombs and you're the very ones that put them in there. Amen. Mm, my, my. Amen. He didn't pull any punches on them. Amen. He just told them, generation of snakes, John said, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Don't begin to say, you have Abraham to your father, we belong to certain big organizations. Are you a Christian? Oh, I'm a Methodist, I'm Presbyterian, I'm Pentecostal, that isn't in it at all. That has more to do than and, 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 and snow does with sunshine, see? It has nothing to do with it. If you're a Christian, you're a born-again servant of God. Amen. Now, now when John came, we had it last night. I remember when you come to this for the context of the thing I, I told you then. Remember, the world is getting the hardest shake it's ever had right now. Amen. The church world. Amen. Amen. Now remember, no doubt in the days of, of John, the days of Jesus, there was great festivals Great speakers in their days. Great intellectual man. They draw tens of thousands times thousands of people. What would Caiaphas do if he called a, a meeting together? He'd bring all Jerusalem. He'd bring all Israel together. From pillar to post. None of them said, oh, now if Caiaphas says certain, certain things, that'll be great. 
Oh, do you believe the scriptures, Rabbi, Reverend, Doctor, Bishop? You believe the scriptures? Certainly I believe the scriptures. I'm a noted scholar. All right. Now the Bible said here that there will come a time that there will be a, a, all the mountains will skip like little rams, all the leaves will clap their hands, and all the high places will be brought down and made low, all the low places will be brought up and made high. And it'll be done by the voice of one crying in the wilderness. You believe that, Rabbi, Reverend, Doctor, Pastor? Sure, I believe that. How will it happen? Oh, God will send a mighty man on earth someday. Oh, he'll be great. He'll be a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Oh, he'll forerun the coming Messiah. And when he comes, there's no doubt in my mind, but what, he'll come down out of heaven and come down to the temple. He'll come right down here at the temple and say, Now, we're going to take all the Romans and beat them to death. That's all. We're going to beat all the Romans down and, and then he's going to say, Come on down, Messiah. And Messiah's going to come down and we're going to mold all of our pruning hooks into, our swords into plowshares and pruning hooks and there'll be no more wars. Uh-huh, that's their interpretation. But what happened when it come? Amen. Yeah. What Amen. taking place? Amen. There was no display of heaven. What they ever seen, there was one, but they didn't see it. Amen. They didn't see it. Hallelujah. <laughs> see, when did all the mountains skip like little rams? When did all the high places come low and the low places high? An old fuzzy-faced preacher come walking out of the wilderness and didn't even know his ABCs. According to history, he went in the wilderness at nine years old and never appeared again until he was 30. He lived off of locusts and wild honey. Locusts is grasshoppers. I'm long grasshoppers. They eat them all the time. Well, you can buy them right here. Don't think that's bad because you can buy them right here in the supermarket if you want them. Bumblebees, honeybees, locusts, rattlesnake, whatever you want. So he lived off of locusts and wild honey. What a diet. But he was kept of the power of God. He didn't dress with his collar turned around as somebody said last night, Brother Parnell or some of them. He didn't dress with a frock tail coat and all about it. Come while the wilderness a big old piece of sheepskin wrapped around him. As I said, maybe we have to take a bath every day and Perhaps he never took one every three or four months out there in the wilderness. I don't know. He wasn't very much to look at. He didn't have no pulpit. He didn't go into any big cities and have big campaigns. He stood out there on the banks of Jordan, mud up to his knees, and said, You generation of vipers, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Mm. That's when the high places are made low. And the low places are made high. <laughs> yes, sir. Then the first thing you know, they expect Messiah to come down with angels and things and settle down on the canopies out there uh, and uh, at the temple where they built for him to come to like we are building great big places today across the nations and so forth. See, and when did he come? He bypassed every one of them synagogues. Amen. Every one of them organizations and come down to a stable. They forced him into it. That's what it is today. He's forced into things. Amen. Uh, forced to do it. Forced to be interdenominational Amen. because his message don't cooperate with the denomination. Amen. His message today preached by his ministers is interdenominational because the denominations asked him out. The Bible said so. Amen. He's on the outside knocking, trying to come in. See? In his own church. That's where it's at. See, it's just the same today. So remember, what looks big to man is little before God. Now that's the reason you don't have to have a lot of flowers and when God comes again, when Jesus comes again, you'll be surprised, that little washwoman back in the alley. <laughs> you'll be surprised, that guy that don't say nothing, keeping his secrets to himself and walking around before God, humble. You'll be surprised. It'll sur I preached not long ago at the judgment, the surprises at the judgment. It won't be surprised to see the bootlegger there. He knows he's going, sure. Won't be surprised to see the liar, the adulterer, everything there. That it, but the surprise will be and the disappointment will be those who think they were going. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then be turned down. Yeah. Those who say, well, wait a minute. My mother belonged to this church. My father belonged to this church. My grandfather and grandmother, I've been a member there all my life. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I didn't even know you. Look at the days when little old Simeon, Unknown man, no reputation. We know nothing of him in the Bible. But the Bible said it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost. Amen. There he is. There you are. That he had not died till he seen the, the Lord's Christ. Then, look at who is John the Baptist. Some kind of an odd-like fellow. 
a woodsman out in the woods. It was revealed to him. He come forth preaching the message. Look at that. Who is little Anne, the little virgin, Mary, down in the, the uh, city of Nazareth, Mina Jeffersonville, and where sin and everything abounded, but she kept herself pure because she knew someday there was a coming Messiah. See? Joseph, a carpenter, had lost his wife and, and was uh, courting this little girl. And as soon as there, the Holy Spirit come to that, and then the world comes around and black names it, like Holy Roller, Pentecostal, See, black named it. Wow, that, she, that child's born out of holy wedlock. See, they believe that. And it looked like it was. But God does that to blind the eyes of the wise and prudent and reveal it to babes such as will learn. I hope there's enough background to want to hit something after a while. I'm going to show you. You see this oil? Now, what I told you, the background, to see that it isn't man, it's God, I'll point to this. All right. Now, come up. Hither was the voice. And when he opened, he heard the trumpet sound. And then immediately John was in the spirit, was in the spirit. And as quick as he got in the spirit, he began to see things. You begin to see things when you get in the spirit. First, you got to get in the spirit. Is that right? Now, what if you went to a ball game and you say, I sure love baseball. Mm -hmm. And you get you a front row seat right down in the box seat. And you're watching the Yankees or Bulldogs, whoever who they are playing. And um, they're all having a big game out there. And your side just about to lose. And all at once the modern babe Ruth winds up his bat like this and says, See where we are? Got three men on base. Whammy! And the riser plumb out of sight. Takes off his hat and fans himself. Walks down to first base and looks around. All them guys go to second base, shake hands with the second baseman, walk, walk quietly right back home. Guys, why, my, my, the screams, the jumps, the hollers, the shouts, the hoorahs. Why, did I've actually seen him take these, you remember the old straw Katie hat? I went to a baseball game one day and seen the guy hit a home run, this guy sat in front of the straw hat, he got all excited, took his hat, just pulled it right down, just put him a collar around like this, where the top went out. Why, he was having him a big time. He, he was so beside himself, he didn't know what he was doing. Amen. Just kicking and a hoorahing and a hollering and a jumping. Well, now, you know what I think? He sure had, he was a, he was a, he loved baseball. He was a baseball fiend, just like a cigarette fiend or a whiskey fiend. I'm a Jesus fiend. <laughs> and I, I just love that. Uh, if you get to be a Jesus fiend, you see, yeah. a fiend after something, then could you imagine that guy say, oh, sure, I'm a baseball fiend. And his side's about to lose, and he's seen him come up and win the game like that. He look around and say, yeah, suppose that was all right. <laughs> say he loves baseball. Oh, he's something. You'd say, why, you don't like it, do you? something wrong with you. Ever a good baseball fiend say, what's wrong with that guy? Something wrong with him. Look at him sitting there. <laughs> That's just so. Put two to two together now. See? Oh, when you're a fiend of Jesus and you feel the Holy Spirit sink in those words, yeah, then something screams out. Oh, you get beyond yourself. Amen. I hope this man forgives me sitting close here. <laughs> the big, tall, black headed fellow sitting here, is standing out there one night in the hall. And somebody said something kind of helped, you know, kind of blessed him like that. And the poor boy's had an awful time. I know his, his wife left him and sued him for divorce because he loved the Lord Jesus. That's right. And somebody said something about Jesus. You know, he was kind of one of those fiends. And he'd been in a war and all shot up and everything the boy was. Felt sorry for him. Come home with a, his children and wife. And he, he promised the Lord he'd serve him. And as soon as the Lord began to bless him and... He got right with God. His wife just turned around and sued him for divorce and left him. Left him set out in the cold. But he still was a fiend. And when he stood there one night and somebody said something about Jesus, something how great he was like that, he said, Oh, glory! Shot his arms out and here his fist was sticking through the wall like that. He didn't know he'd done it. Had his fist sticking to the wall. He said, Brother Bill, I'll pay for that. I think Brother Wood's coming out and put the piece on. Put another piece on. We didn't mind that, Brother Ben. We just, uh, we just uh, glad you was a fiend. 
See, when the Holy Spirit does something to you, you just can't sit still. There's something bubbles over. Amen. Amen. Uh, something takes a hope, a fiend for Christ. When you love the Lord, just something in you reaching out, grabbing, hungering, and thirsting. Jesus said, Blessed are they, for they shall be filled. Amen. Blessed are they. They even thirst whether you've got it or not. How many wants more of God? Yeah. All right. Well, the reason that you want more of God, you're blessed just to be that. Amen. If you haven't got it, you're still blessed. Amen. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst. Yes. You're Amen. blessed just to hunger and thirst because you want it. You're blessed Amen. because there's many people who don't want it. Remember my sermon the other night? See? Like the moron, he kept the box and threw the gift away. <laughs> See? Don't take the box. Take the gift. Amen. All right. Now immediately in the Spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven and one set upon the throne. Now notice, a little later on, we got it last night, I believe, that upon this throne that we find out that first there was nothing on the throne and now there's someone on the throne. So it showed that Jesus had come with his church up into glory and was set on his own throne. Amen. Setting on the throne. That's after the church age. Now, now, we want to get to that after a while. Now you say, well, where is this throne at today? Now, Brother Neville, if I pass over that, you ask me after a while, where is this throne at today? I think I'll get to it down that far. Where is this throne at now? If he's not on his throne now, he isn't on his throne now. No, sir. All right. Now, and he that set was to look upon like jasper and sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around about the throne. In the likeness, in the sight, like unto an emerald. Now, let's take now the third verse to start. And so, Jasper, this one that sat on the throne, was to look up on. In other words, when you looked at him, he was in such splendor, such beauty. Oh, I want to see him, don't you? Yeah. One day I remember Sister Cadle, Sister Howard Cadle, many of you remember her. Yes. I was across the street there, and my wife sat there now, remembers, she was cold in the room, and I got up and had a little monkey stove out there with the, we baked the bread up in an oven and a pipe, and uh, I, it was real cold, and wind was blowing, wintertime, snow on the ground, wind down the smokestack, and I couldn't get that thing to burn to save my life, and I was just so tore up about it and I put something that blew out again Billy was cold and she was cold I was trying to make a fire and then I had to turn on the radio and a few minutes before I just got warmed up come on and Sister Cato was singing when I reach that land on a faraway strand I want to see Jesus don't you oh my I just sat right down in the middle of the floor and just sat there and started crying you know how she could sing down how that real sweet Mockingbird voice of hers. I want to hear her when I cross over the border. Over the she said, I want to see Jesus, don't you? I thought, oh God, yes, I want to see him someday. When the fowls are all floated by, I want to see Jesus. Huh? To see him up on his throne, his beauty, his splendor. I, oh, I want to stand where John did, so I can just stand and look at him. Here some time ago, down the slavery time. I say this in behalf of my colored friends that's here this morning. There's an old colored man and he was uh, went over to a little place he used to and he used to do this down in Kentucky. Have same maybe Mama Cox and them can remember when he used to go and have singings, you know, go out to the houses and they'd play an organ, the young folks and all sing. You stood up here at Utica and around in the country places now they got a quarter of whiskey out somewhere in a rock and roll party, but then they sang hymns. One of these old hymn singings this old colored brother got saved. And the Lord called him to preach. And the next day, he went around telling the slaves on the plantation, he said, the Lord saved me last night. He's called me to preach to my brethren. And finally got back to the owner of the ranch, or the owner of the plantation. He called him in and said, Sambo, I want you to come in here. He said, come up to my office. He said, yes, sir. Walked up to the office. He said, what's this I hear you're scattered amongst the slaves? 
amongst them fellows out there, my hands, my slaves, that the Lord made you free. I said, yes, sir. He said, boss, I'm your slave. He said, I was bought with your money. But, he said, but the way that God made me free last night, Jesus made me free from a life of sin and shame and a life of death. He made me free. He said, Sambo, do you really mean that? He said, I mean it. He said, I heard him say that you was going to start preaching around here to your, your people on the plantations and things. He said, yes, sir. So that's what I aim to do is preach this gospel to my people. He said, you really mean it, Sambo? He said, I really mean it. He said, come go with me down to the, to the court. I'm going to also give you your freedom. You're free from me and you're free from any more slave. I bought you, you're mine, and I'm setting you free so that you can preach the gospel to your people. He went out and signed the emancipation of the proclamation and he was set free. He could no more be sold as a slave. He was a free man to preach the gospel. He preached among his brethren for years. Many white people was converted under his ministry. One day the old fellow come down to die. He had preached for 30 or 40 years or more. And when he come down to die, he was laying in the room. And many of his white brethren had gathered around in the room. And they thought he was gone for about two or three hours. Then when he finally woke up and looked around the room, he said, Where was you, Sam Boy? He said, Oh, is I back here again? Is I back again? He said, What's the matter, Sambo? He said, oh, I crossed over into the other land. He said, tell us about it. He said, well, I just come in to his presence. And said, when I stood there, he said, there was an angel walked up. said, is your name Sambo so-and-so? He said, yes, it is. He said, come in. Walked inside. I looked at him sitting there. He said, Sambo, come here now if you see me. I want you to come out here. We want to give you your robe. We want to give you your heart. We want to give you your crown. Sambo said, don't talk to me about harps, crowns, and robes. He said, but you want a reward. We want to give you your reward. So don't talk about me about rewards. He said, just let me stand and look at him for a thousand years. That'll be my reward. I think that's about the way we'd all feel. Just let me stand and look at him. Oh, I'll have to have a different body than I got now. Yeah. Every fiber of your being used to look at him. There John stood and seen him sitting on the throne, and he was to look like jasper and sardine stone. Oh. Now, all things and every word has a meaning in the Bible. Now, jasper and sardine stone. Now, if you'll notice, it compares with the rest of Scripture. In the back parts of Scripture, he was Alpha Omega. He was beginning and the ending. He was the first and the last. He was Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He was all in all was bundled in Him. Matthew 17 shows that up in the Mount Transfiguration, it was all gathered in Him. Now, Jasper was a, was a stone and Sarding was a stone. Now, we'll get to their colors after a bit. Now, I want you to notice that each one of the patriarchs, when they were born... Yeah, every person has a birthstone. Mine, I was born in April, diamond. And different months represents different stones. Well, the patriarchs was the same. Every time that a patriarch, when he was born, he had a birthstone. And just to stop right here just a moment. When them Hebrew mothers, let me show you a divine word, friends. So that your faith will be built certain in the word of God. Amen. Every time them Hebrew mothers when they were in labor, giving labor pains to born birth these children, the very words that she uttered in her birth give the man, the baby that was born of her, his name and positionally placed him in Palestine where he'll be at the coming of the Lord. Amen. The labor pains in this mother. Like Ephraim means by the sea. See? And Ephraim was given his lot by the sea. And say Judah. I meant, I don't know what the word means, but I could pick it out. And I see that's where I don't have time. These short things to pick those things up. But then go back and Judah, wherever Judah means, means his position placed among the children of Israel. And take a Genesis 48 and 49. You'll find out there that Jacob, when he was dying, leaning on his staff, blinded, 
He positionally told those children where they would be at the end of the world. Amen. And they're positionally set right there now since he went back to the homeland. Oh, hallelujah. Told Joseph, thou art a fruitful vine by the wall. See, by the well, the water. He went over. He said, you've trusted in the Lord God. You made your, your bow strong in the United States, see, in the Lord. But someday that vine was coming back over the wall. Amen. And there she is, right there now. Just exactly what he said pretty near 3,000 years ago. Turning right back. Told Ephraim he had dipped his feet in the oil and Ephraim settled right there where the big oil wells are. Just exactly. The utterance of those people. What was on those mortals? God. Amen. Taking their fibers and moving in them. Yes. Looked like when the Roman Empire scattered them when others scattered them when they was hated by Hitler Tens of thousands times thousands shot bubbles in their veins and they died. You can see their bodies hanging on fences with their babies and everything else and bones and tucked and made fertilized out of their bones. Just take them out there and give them a shot. Put them in a wagon. They get out, time they get out the end of their start, they sing the Messiah will come and we'll drink the blood of the grape again. When they went down dying, them Jews walking out there going, a few blue or beats in their heart will be gone and down they go singing, we will see the Messiah come. <laughs> Oh my. Making fertilize out of their bones. A lot of you soldiers in here know that and seen it. I stood on the grounds where they burn them and everything else. There, Hitler and them. And look up at Stalin and Russia and all of them done the same thing. That's right. But that Jew, what was the matter? He is forced back to his homeland. There's where they're standing. I got that great film three minutes before midnight. One of them Jews come in and just asked him, said, why are you coming back for? To die in the homeland? said, we've come to see the Messiah. Amen. Hey, 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 mm. We're at the end time. Each one of those children, when they were born, they had a birth stone. And when Aaron, the high priest, over each one of those children, had a breastplate on him, his dress. That's what I want to hold off just a little longer to get into this sixth verse because that brings in every symbol of the Old Testament right into there. Every, all the furniture and everything in the Old Testament was a pattern of that was seen in heaven. Pattern back to the human being. And here's Aaron's breastplate. He's the high priest. Notice the birthstone of each tribe was represented in there. One of birthstone put his stone in there. The tribe of Ephraim, the tribe of Manassas, the tribe of Gad, the tribe of Benjamin, all was represented in here. And that's how then they take those birth stones and pretty gems and hang it on the post like this. And if a prophet prophesied, and if it's so right or not, they take him down to this year and thunder him and let him tell his prophecy. If there's a sacred light, come on there and begin to flash these stones together. It was God speaking back. It's for the whole tribe. All Amen. of them. <laughs> Every tribe. Now, on these, the first stone... The first, how many knows who the first child was? What was his name? Reuben. All right. Who was the last one? Benjamin. That's right. The birthstone of Reuben was Jasper. The birthstone of Benjamin was Sardin. He was to look upon as Reuben and Benjamin. The first and the last. He that was, which is, and shall come. He was Alpha, A, in the Greek alphabet. Omega, Z, in the Greek alphabet. He was the first, the last. He was from Benjamin to Reuben, from Reuben to Benjamin. Oh, there he was. Look upon as Sardis stone and as Jasper stone. He was sitting on this stone. How would you all like to see him sitting up on his glory? Let's turn over to Revelation 21.10 right quick and just take a look at him here. All right, 21 and 10 to 11. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Having the glory of God. And her lights was like unto stone most precious, even like Jasper's clear as crystal. Amen. Her light. The light. Who is the light? Amen. 
and the city had no need of the sun because the Lamb is the light thereof. Jasper, Sardis stone. The glory of God is Jesus Christ. The glory of Jesus Christ is His church. And He was the first. What was He? He was the beginning of time. He is the ending of time. He was the first of the patriarchs. He is the last of the patriarchs. He was the church that was in the... He was the... The spirit that was in the church of Ephesus. He is the spirit of the church in Laodicea. He is the first and the last. A to Z. The first, last, he that was and shall come. Root and offspring of David, the morning star, the lily of valley, the rose of Sharon. All these 400 and something titles in the Bible pertains to him. Just think of it, what he was. And yet he was the lowly Lord Jesus that was born in a manger. <laughs> to the praises of God. Anything that's humble, watch it, because that's right. Anything that's big is a stuffed shirt, so don't pay no attention to it. See? It's a lot of wind and no, nothing to it. All right. Now, he was looked upon as Jasper and Sardis stone. Let's turn back. Have you, we got a little time, haven't we? Amen. We got about 40 minutes yet. Let's notice. Let's turn back to Ezekiel 1. Go back in the Bible to the Old Testament onto Ezekiel. And let's read here where Ezekiel saw him too. And compare these scriptures now and see where we're at. Ezekiel, the first chapter. All right, now let's read for a moment. I'm going to read the first five verses and then we're going to read. I've got marked out here from 26 to 28. But let's read the first verses now. The first chapter of Ezekiel, the prophet. All right, and it came to pass in the 30th year. And in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives, uh, among the captives by the river of Chebar. Is that right? Chebar, C-H-E-B-B-R, Chebar. And the heavens were open, and I saw a vision of God. And in, now watch, in the fifth day of the month, which is the month that King Jehoiakim was captive, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzza, in the land of Chaldeans, by the river of Chebar. And the hand of the Lord was upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. What's this prophet here? 595 years before the coming of Christ. See how his vision compares with John. A whirlwind came out of the north. A great cloud of fire unfolding itself, and the brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof was a color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a likeness of man. Notice the color of the Spirit of God, which was above the likeness of these four creatures was amber. Amen. Amber is yellowish green. Now watch. Yellowish green. Amber. Oh, he's the same yesterday. He revealed himself to Ezekiel. In the midst of Ezekiel's vision... This light that he saw coming above the four living creatures was yellowish green. When he come to John, he appeared in the emerald, which is also yellowish green. He comes down to the revelator in yellowish green. He comes to us in yellowish green. The light, walk in the light. He is the light. Let's go to the 26th verse now so we can read to the 28th. The 26th verse. And above the... Oh, when you get home, I want you to mark that and read every bit of it. Save time. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of stone. As the appearance of sardin stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above it. That was the Son of Man. See, Christ. Now watch how he was how he was arrayed here. And I saw as the colors of amber. 
Watch, around this Son of Man. As the appearance of a fire around about within it, uh, about within in it, from the appearance of his loins, listen, be spiritual, be understanding, and in your own heart, your eye, in Jesus' name, keep this to yourself. But just remember how blissful. Us, let's start again in the 27th verse. Listen, everyone, be real understanding now. And I saw as the color of amber, that's yellowish green, as the appearance of fire around about it, fire around the amber screen. Now, from the appearance of his loins, even upward, from his loins upward, and from the appearance of his loins downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had the brightness around about, fire all around, as the appearance of a bowl, and in the color, in the days of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness around about. This was the appearance and the likeness and the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. Watch. Are you ready? Listen. Keep this now. Just remember. To let you know. Gene, you can hold this tape. Listen. No, I don't have to hold it there. That's all I mean is keep the tape for a minute. Just to the church. Notice this. Now that you might know that the color of the light that's with the Lord and the Lord's light that follows the Lord and is, is the Lord is amber. Yellowish green. That's the same color of the light that's with us today as the scientist has took its picture. Yellowish green. Amber. When a little boy and I've seen it for my first time you remember the old timers here? I always told you before the actual picture was taken, it was yellowish green, which is amber. Now, to let you know that the Spirit of the Lord, He said when He seen it from the loins of the living creature that stood in His presence, from His loins upward was like fire, a light. From His loins downward was covered with light. And all around was many colors like unto a rainbow. Is that right? Amen. I want you to remember, God still exists in the same colors. Amen. From the lines, upward, fire, amber, color shot with a movie camera or with a color camera. Amber from the lines up, from the lines down, and all around, many colors, like as in the rainbow in the sky after a rain. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Holy Spirit still in His power, still in His church, in this last days. There you are. Not me, I was just standing there. But it was a picture that was taken. I want you to look at that. Just exactly what Ezekiel saw. Amen. Same colors the same way and acted the same way and flushed the same way. All the living creatures. Amen. What is it the living creatures represents? The living church. Amen. The church that's a living by the power and the resurrection of Christ. And the same amber colors has covered from loins upward from loins downward. Amen. There's no more guessing. Amen. Science has tucked the picture. Look at the colors. Just look at the colors of fire in there. The, Amen. the rainbow. Look at this yellowish ember color. Now, on this camera, there's just a straight photographer's camera. On this camera was color, colored pictures, chrotochrome color. Look at the amber colors in there. If I could get it over a light somewhere where you can see it in the back. Can you see now? Like unto a rainbow. Look at the streets coming back and forth like the rainbow. Every one a different color. We're going to get into that in a few minutes. What are those colors and what do they uh, reflect? Amen. 
Amen. Oh, I just makes my poor heart jump for joy and to know that in this day that we're living at Christ, when all other grounds is sinking, sands all other grounds. I think, why can't I tell that? Why can't I make the world see it? The world wasn't meant to see it. The world won't see it. They never will see it. But the church is receiving the mighty shaking it ever had. In them days, they couldn't have took a picture of it. They can now because they got the mechanical devices. The ones who are trying to take the mechanics to deny God comes right back around and proves there is a God. That's right. Ambrose. I remember, I never made that up. I'm reading it to you right out of the Bible. Watch. As I read and look and behold that it is the same Lord God. There's no difference. Watch the 27th verse. And I saw the color of amber as in the appearance of fire. See, like blaze is licking. See? Amber colors coming from a fire. You see it now? Yeah. Amber. This is amber. Colors coming from a fire. Down here it says, And they appear like a bow or a rainbow in the days after a rain. Rainbow. In the days after a rain. And there was a, a living creature. What John represented the entire church was taken up, I told you. One person here in a vision can represent the entire body of Christ. Yeah. Colored. Amen. Now watch. And I saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire about with it. And the appearance from the appearance of his loins even upward. And from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire. Watch. Look at the fire spring. Out of what? The rainbow. The seven colors. Now watch, there's exactly seven colors there. And the rainbow has seven colors. I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had the brightness around about. As the appearance of a bowl that is in the clouds in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness around about. Round about the throne of God, see? This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of of the Lord. Not the Lord. Now the glory of the Lord. Amen. The glory of the Lord covering over His church because He is in His church. Amen. 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 Oh, it sounds foolish to the unwise. Amen. But how great it is to those who believe. Amen. This was the appearance and likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice speak. Now he goes ahead and tells what the vision meant, which we not have time to get into this morning. Now, notice how the Lord in His great mercy give us these things. Now, let's take another. Both Ezekiel and John saw Him in the mystery of His colors and light. And he called it an amber color. John later, you that put your, putting down the scriptures, 1 John 1, 5 to 7. John later, as on the Isle of Patmos about three years when he wrote the book, when he come back an old man in his 90s. In 1 John 1, 5 and 7, he said, God is light. Amen. John had an experience. He had seen him, and he knew that he was light, light, eternal light. Not cosmic light, not lamp light, electric light, sunlight, but eternal light. Amen. Oh, how I love him. God is light. Notice, we're going to start back now and see where we're at on the third verse yet, aren't we? Are we going to get it? I hope. All right. He was to look up on as Jasper and Sardis stone. And there was a rainbow about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. Yellowish green. Now, rainbow. You notice there's a rainbow. Let's go back in Genesis 9 and find out in Genesis 9, 13. And we'll find back here the rainbow. When a rainbow first appeared. Genesis, the ninth chapter. 
And we will begin at the 13th verse. Genesis 9, 13. Oh, you like this? Amen. Oh, I love it. I just don't like it. I love it. Amen. Look. I do set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be for a token, watch, token of a covenant betwixt me and the earth. Amen. What? Betwixt me and Noah? No, betwixt me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which, which is betwixt me and you. Now I come back to his covenant betwixt them, but the rainbow covenant. See, the covenant was life for Noah that he spared him, but the covenant that God made with himself was a rainbow. Amen. That he would not. Now, I'll show you what Noah's covenant was with God in a minute. But this year was God's own covenant with himself. Amen. Amen. A rainbow. Now, we find out that a covenant then is a talking, a token. God said it was a token here, didn't he? Amen. See? Amen. I set my, I do set my bow in the clouds. That's after the destruction of the world. Destroyeth water, all flesh besides Noah. Noah was destroyed. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Amen. Not me and the world. The world's a cosmos. See? But this is between me and the earth. God said, I made that earth and I so evilly uh, treated it that I just turn it upside down and flash it to pieces and, and I, I, I oughtn't to have done it maybe. He said, I, I'm even sorry. It's such a horrible thing. What do you think it'll be when he comes in his anger now? Amen. Be right, sinner friend. Oh, be watching and waiting. That sight to behold. He's coming again. You believe that? Amen. He's coming again. I love that, don't you? Amen. Oh, would you be numbered as one of his foal? I wouldn't want to be that, would you? No, sir. Uh, uh, be a foe against, uh, be a foe for him. Be with him and be fine. But against him, no. be spotless within. Yeah. Be watching and waiting that sight to behold. Yeah. He's coming again. Amen. Mm. Amen. Now, a covenant, a token of what? A token of what? Of a sacrifice that has been accepted. Now, get Genesis eight twenty and twenty two. Now, Genesis 8, 20 and 22. All right? Right across the page it is. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet Savior. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground, curse the ground, any more for a man's sake, for the imagination of his heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything liveth as I have done. And I read the last verse. And while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. A covenant same thing that John saw. Jesus, God's accepted covenant, surrounded in the heavens and around about him was a rainbow around about the throne in the sight like an emerald, amberish, green, light around the throne. Praise be to God. Watch. Notice composed of primarily Noah's rainbow, composed primarily of seven colors. Anybody knows the rainbow's got seven colors? Now, what are the colors? Red, orange, violet, red, red, orange, green, blue, indigo, and violet. That's the colors of the rainbow. Now, we got a deep thing here, and I'm just going to have to hit the high spots of it because it's getting too late. Now remember, 
orange, a red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Now, if you notice, seven, watch, seven rainbows, seven colors, I mean seven colored rainbow, that meant seven bows, seven bows, seven churches, Amen. reflecting seven lights, <laughs> each light wrapped into the other one. It started off with red, red after red come orange, which is a reflection of red. After orange with after after orange come yellow, which is red and orange mixed together, makes yellow, then green, green and blue makes black, then come indigo, and then from indigo come violet, which is part of blue. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't you see? God in his seven Colored rainbow, his covenant. Amen. Amen. That he made a covenant that through seven church ages Amen. of seven colors, Amen. he would save the earth. What would he do? Remember, he made it with the earth, his color. But now watch, this rainbow only horizontally just covers in a bowl one half the earth. That's all Noah's rainbow colored. Just covered. Just half the earth is in an arch. That's all you can see. But when John saw him yeah. in his angel color, he surrounded the whole throne of God. The half has never yet been told. Amen. He covered. He just, the earth just makes an arch. It's just a half of it. That's the church ages. But when John saw him in this amber color, the amber color, he surrounded and covered around like a halo. Amen. A halo. Amen. A halo of amber color surrounded him. Amen. See? One color, one God over all, through all, and in all. Amen. But there is seven church ages. Watch a great diamond. Used to find him, you can find him in Africa laying on the streets. You're daring to keep one because it isn't cut. If you got one that isn't cut, they'll penitentiary for it right now and give you a lifetime sentence for keeping it. You've got to turn it in as soon as you find it. Now they take this diamond. Oh, it's a hard thing. I've seen a big 40 ton grinder standing up like this. They pour, pour that blue stone in there, grind it around it, and mashes that rock into just like ashes. But it won't match the diamond. That 40 ton hanging on a swivel up here, rolling around that big cogs like that, just crushing that rock to pieces, but a diamond will go right through it. It'll move that 40 ton casting. Amen. Oh. When it crushes out and comes down through a sifter, sifts down to other sifters, washes down, and then finally goes down a long runway. The manager of that Great Kimberly Diamond Mines is one of my ushers down there in the line. Real humble, sweet brother. And then for about three feet over that water where it flows, it's, it's cosmoline put on there. You know what? Um, what does she call this stuff? The media water is that we got in the jar in the cabinet in there. Vaseline. And then we uh, put that uh, uh, Vaseline about an uh, inch deep. Way up here on the slide it comes down. And notice... Every time that that rock comes over, it'll roll right off that bass thing, but when a diamond comes over, it'll stick. A diamond's dry. <laughs> and it'll stick to that. I've seen them pick them up, even them little bitty ones, and separate them with eyeglasses. And I asked them what they're doing it for. I said they sell them to America for Victrola needles and things. They won't wear out, see. But those big diamonds, now there they are, just one big ball. But when they take them and take Electrical machines and cut them and make a cut diamond. Then when they cut it, it's to reflect the fiery colors of his carrot. And it'll reflect seven colors also. Amen. Oh, how that Jesus. Oh, you might have a lot of money. You might own a fleet of Cadillacs. You might be a pastor of some great big morgue or cathedral or something. You might be a bishop or an archbishop. But oh, brother. When you find that jewel, that diamond, a man sells all his wealth he's got, gives it away to everything else. 
Look at the sleeping virgin. Yeah. Oh, what did she do? She had to sell something in order to buy her all. What did she have to sell? Her old creeds and denominations and things. She sold out all she had yeah. in order to find Christ. Christ, that great jewel, Jesus, that body. Body, I have a ticket to go to heaven when the train comes by one of these dark mornings. Oh, what? Nothing, oh, precious is that flow that makes me find a snow. No other pound time, no nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. No popularity, no big things, no nothing, no riches, no, no nothing. Just give me that precious flow, that's all. Amen. Nothing in my arms I bring simply to thy cross I cling. That great jewel, what was it? It was perfect. Is at the age of 33 and a half years old when God put it through the big bumping machine. <laughs> when he took it over there and began to shape it up, he cut it, he mashed it, he bruised it. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. What did God do to that perfect man? There's only one of them in the world. Only one in the world, and that was him. Amen. And God chiseled him off here. He was wounded for our transgressions because I was a sinner. He let the rainbow light of his seven church ages flash upon me to know that he was wounded for my transgressions. There's your seven colored rainbow. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace upon him with his stripes we were healed. God cut him and bruised him and mashed him and cut him that he might reflect to his dying wounds. Amen. Forgiveness of sin, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness. The seven spirits of God are the seven fruits of the Spirit that would reflect back in his people. He was bruised, shaped. And form that the light of God shining through that one man's body might redeem the whole world. Amen. I'll be lifted up from the earth. I'll draw all men unto me. Watch those rainbow colors as we reflect. But when John saw him here, what was it? The day of redeeming was over. It's all over. So he's seen him back in his original condition, an amber color. Not only just half the world, you can only the sun only shines on half the world at a time. See, as it goes around. But when John saw him, he was setting to look upon his jasper and sardis stone. Amber colors mixed the two together got amber. And an amber color around the throne. Amen. Oh, my. oh I, I tell you that just we can just go on and on. Seven spirits, seven colors. Seven church ages, seven ministers, seven lights. Everything's in a seven. God's perfect in seven. God works six days, seven day rest. The world exists six thousand years and seven thousands millennium. Notice in a half circle, half's not yet been known. Now, surely these things represent something. Now, in Exodus twenty three thirteen. And in Hebrews 6.12, God made a covenant with Himself and swore by Himself. Amen. Hebrews 13 tells us, that uh, or 9.13, that He swore by Himself. There was no greater to swear by when He told Abraham and Isaac, that He told Abraham that He'd make a covenant with Him, an everlasting covenant. God, a covenant is always made by an oath, so there's nobody, you take an oath by somebody greater than you. Take an oath by your mother. Take an oath by your nation. Take an oath by something. Take an oath by God. But you can't take an oath unless it's somebody greater than you. And there was nobody greater than God. So he took an oath himself by himself. <laughs> Swearing by himself that he would confirm this covenant. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Swear by him. He would preserve the seed of Abraham. What is the seed of Abraham to the Gentile? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The seed of Abraham swore by himself, I'll raise him everyone up. I'll give him eternal life and place him back here on the earth. What we got to hear, think about. So we see him in the circle bowl of green, amber color. This greenish, what does green represent? Life. 
Green is evergreen, always stays green as life. What does it mean? That God has promised, as He took an oath back there in Genesis, that He would no put the rainbow in the sky, that He would no more destroy this world by water. He also takes His oath and swears by Himself that all the seed of Abraham He'll raise up, and this world will stand all of its shaking judgments. The judgments we're going through on the future lessons we got coming will show you where this world will belch and turn into volcanics and blow to pieces and upside down and everything. But he swears by himself that he'll not destroy it. Amen. But he'll smooth her off again and put his children on here for that millennium. Oh, my. I'm watching for the coming of that glad millennium day when our blessed Lord shall come and catch his waiting bride away. Oh, my heart is longing, crying for that day of sweet release when our Savior shall come back to earth again. Oh, how we are longing to see that day. He promised the great millennium would come. And another thing, the reason He was surrounded, He is a covenant-keeping God. He will keep His covenant. Now, let's get the next verse anyhow. All right, we won't get one more. And we got just about 10, 15 minutes to do it. Are you too tired? No. You want to go ahead? All right. Amen. Let's take the fourth verse. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed with white raiment, and they had on their head crowns of gold. We may not get all the way through that verse. Well, let's start. The fourth verse. Look now, when John saw him, that emerald color around him, we got all the colors of rainbows and so forth and what it all was about. Now on the fourth verse, first thing he speaks of here on the fourth verse, and around about the throne. Watch. It's such a beautiful picture here. Don't miss it. The throne. You know, let's go back to Moses. Moses, we ain't got time to dig it up, so you just take what I'm saying. Moses, when he uh, was give a vision up on Mount Sinai, I, I want you to notice that this was not a throne of grace no more. Amen. There, the blood had been gone, and the sacrifice was back again, and it had been accepted, and the blood was off the mercy seat, and it was now a judgment seat. Because thunders and lightning issued off of it. Is that right? Yeah. Remember, it's like Mount Sinai. When Moses went on Mount Sinai, what happened? Thunder, lightning. And even if a cow or a calf or a sheep or anyone even touched the mountain, it must die. The Bible said, so great was the quake that even Moses feared it. And Moses said, take off your shoes, you're your own holy ground. Joshua, the great warrior, was to take the children over and divide their inheritances. Could only come halfway up the mountain. Here stood Moses up there with the colors of God's flashes and lightnings and emeralds around him. Amen. Watching them commandments be written. Standing in the presence of God. That voice speaking back out of Moses, where are you? Take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. A judgment seat it was now. Nothing could stand there but the redeemed. Sinner could not approach it at all. Amen. It's finished. A judgment seat. All right. Now, Moses made things on earth, made the tabernacle like the things that he saw in heaven. We know that, don't we? Amen. We find Paul did the same thing. Must have Hebrews 9, 23. That Moses made things just like he did. And Paul, in his vision, when he went up into heaven, when he taught that great book of Hebrews, he must have saw in his vision the same thing that Moses saw. Because he said he taught that wonderful book of Hebrews how the Christianity uh, was the antitype of the Old Testament. He was a great teacher, uh, Mo, uh, Paul was. Now, that was his throne then. Then in the... Let's just, let's just, I can't, I was going to pass this up, but I just can't do it. Where's the back? Did you take it back? Is it back, Don? Well, maybe I can make you see it from here. I, I, I'll get your pencils and paper where I want to say something here. I, I said this morning, if something came to me, 
Now, I'll tell you what I did. If you notice, I got it drawn on the back of here. See? Just draw it out as the Spirit gave it to me. See? Draw it out on here of what it be. But I, I want to say something right here. Now, God, when He is enthroned, He is then judge. Is that right? Amen. When does a judge a judge? When He comes to His judgment seat. Amen. A throne. Now, I want you to watch how the Old Testament was made. How the courts approaching to His throne was made. And how John saw here, we won't get to it this morning, all of it, but how John saw the same courts of the approach to him and what the approach to his courts is. Now, oh, I love this. Now, in the Old Testament, there was what was called the congregation, where the people gathered. First thing before they come into congregation, they enter in there, they had to come under the shed blood, outer courts. First, they come to the waters of separation where the red heifer was killed and made a waters of separation. That's the sinner who comes and listens at the word. That's how this great Jewish rabbi was just brought to the Lord. Heard me preach on that down in, at uh, Tulsa. At yeah, Tulsa, it was. Wasn't it? At Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he come over there just a bystander. And he went after service. He said, I know. So that he's one of the seven outstanding rabbis of the world. And he come over there and said, I want to see what them Christian businessmen, they call them Pentecostals. I want to go over and sit down and listen. And when the Lord had me to speak on that red heifer sacrifice, after the service he met some of the brother back there said, I want to meet the man. I know that he hasn't even got an education. But said, I'm a Jewish rabbi who knows all those different approaches and things like that. said, I've never seen that in all my life. <laughs> said, I've never seen it in now. He's a Pentecostal rabbi. Feel with the Holy Ghost going everywhere, preaching the gospel. Pentecostal rabbi calls himself. He went over to at the Washington Yuri Hotel the other day when we met together down at Brother Jack's, and the lady knew him. She said, Rabbi, she said, We got a nice room for him, but said, We haven't got an old television there. So them things are hell visions. Cast them out. Don't want them in there anyhow. Now make it throw it out. She said, Rabbi. He said, I'm a Pentecostal rabbi. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> said now when you go to Israel brother Branham I want to go with you said we can take it to our people I said not now Rabbi not now not now not the hour yet wait a little bit now notice these holy places now when you come into the courts the first was the courts the outer courts the next was the altar where the sacrifices was offered the brazen altar then outside the Braden's altar, there was a veil hung here that went into the Holy of Holies. In there was a mercy seat. In there was the cherubims. That's what I want to get to in our next lesson. Those cherubims overshadowing the mercy seat. Oh, my. Oh, I, we can just stay all month on it. See? On that cherubim. Now, now notice as they entered in, the congregation could come there. The priest could stand here. But just the high priest could go in there once a year, Amen. taking the blood with him. And he had to be dressed a certain way, a certain garment. Had to have a bell and a pomegranate, one to one another. And when he walked, he had to walk a certain way. As he walked, he played holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Those bells and pomegranates ringing together. Holy, holy, holy. Why? He was approaching God. Amen. Amen. Having the blood of the covenant in his hand going before him, bearing the blood. Anointed. Oh, my. But certain perfumes. His clothes had to be made by Holy Ghost filled hands. Registered hands. Make his clothes. The robes of Sharon. The anointing oil. Poured it on his head and run all down his beard. And then down over his place with a royal perfume, a pomegranate and a bell, taking the blood of an innocent lamb. And he dared to approach that veil outside and die right there where he was standing. So he had to go walking a certain way. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Holy, holy, holy approaching God unto the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. And he went there and offered the blood on the mercy seat once a year. And while he was in there, he was privileged to see the Shekinah glory. Amen. When the pillar of fire, the amber light, 
that come down that led the children out of Israel. He even smoked up the temple. Amen. So no one could see it. The glory of the Lord fell till it was all smoked up. And he came in himself, went in behind the veil, and settled out on the mercy seat in the holies of holies. Amen. Most holy place is called. Holy of holies. And he had to be dressed a certain way, walk a certain way, anointed a certain way. He was a special person. Amen. To go in there, how the congregation must have envied him. But when Jesus died, the temple veil rent. Amen. Not only a high priest, but whosoever will can have that same anointing of the Shekinah glory and walk a holy life, holy, holy, holy unto the Lord and approach in the very presence of God Amen. through the blood of Jesus Christ before him. Take him with him. Lord Jesus, here lays a sick man. He's my brother. He's on the death's bed right now to die. I'm approaching you. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. What for? As a high priest, what for? In behalf of my brother. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. There you are, your daily walk, your daily talk, your daily behavior, your heart, your soul and all. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. No roots of bitterness, no nothing else. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord as it begins to approach in behalf of our brother. Whosoever will may come anointed, blood in front of him, the blood going before him, playing holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. Now that was the outer courts, the holy place, and the holiest of holies. That was God's sanctuary on earth. Watch. It was typed after that in heaven. Amen. Now we're going to come right back again to the same scripture. Oh, oh, as we go through revelations, we can come right straight on back to this again. See? Now, John, where John standing? At the courts. Let's just read this a little farther here so you get the picture. And out of the throne proceed lightnings, thunders, voices, and there were seven lamps of fire. Wait till we get to that. Burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Reflecting the light of God into the church, right straight from the throne of God, not through a seminary, not through some bishop, Amen. but from the throne of God by revelation of the power of His resurrection, Amen. making Him the same yesterday for them seven stars standing there reflecting that light, the Shekinah light from the Shekinah glory, Amen. from the holiest of holy. Seven lamps on fire, sitting on top of these candlesticks, reflecting His light, His colors of His power of His resurrection, Amen. right into the church. Amen. Mm. And before the throne was a sea of glass, likened unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And he goes ahead and begins to give this, these beasts the same thing Ezekiel saw. Them guards, one like a man, one like a lion. And one like the eagle. What was it? Now watch when we bring them in and show that lion of the tribe of Judah and all those different ones out of their tribe to set on four walls and they were guarding this mercy seat. Oh, what a picture. Oh, I just, there's great days ahead. As we see them. Now that was God's throne in heaven. Moses patterned it on earth. Was God strong because His judgment seat was represented here on earth in the Holy of Holies? Amen. Amen. God, all Israel come to that one place to find mercy because God only met under the shed blood. Now listen close. Then the Shekinah glory raised from that mercy seat one day and is settled on another tabernacle. Amen. Amen. This one. The Father judges no man, but he's committed all judgment to the Son. God's judgment seat. You speak against me, it'll be forgiven you. Speaking of another one coming, another mercy seat. Speak, you speak against the Son of Man, I will forgive you, but someday the Holy Spirit will come to dwell in the hearts of the people. One word against it will never be forgiven. It keeps getting more severe and more severe all the time, the judgment. Because God's continually wearing His patience out, trying to get sinners to come to Him to be reconciled. 
First he was in the heavens above and shined through the stars. The second he was on earth shining through the Shekinah glory. Next he come and has made flesh and blood among us. Still wearing his patience. Now he redeemed man by his blood. Hallelujah. Came into his church in the form of the Holy Ghost. And speak against that. It's a finished thing. Amen. It's done. Amen. Now you can see where the shaking comes. Amen. Where the time they don't realize. People can't comprehend what it means. Now. The first throne was in heaven. Judgment seat. The second throne was in Christ. The third throne is in man. Now, let me take this little thing that I've got drawn here. We're going to make, I wish I had a blackboard and I could make it maybe more sensible for you. We're going to take, draw the courts, only make it in a round ring. Or like this, either one. Now we're going to take, I think like this maybe would be the best. We're going to take and make the courts. Now what is a man? He's a triune being. Amen. Body, soul, and spirit. How many knows that? Amen. Watch God's approach. What is his heart? You remember my message? God chose a man's heart for his control tower. The devil chose his head for his control tower. See? He makes him see things, look through his eyes. But God in his heart makes him believe things that he cannot see. See? See? God is on his heart. In the heart of man is a throne of God. You get it? Man, God made his throne in the heart of man. Now watch. What's the first part of the man? The first part of a man is body. The next part is his soul, which is the nature of his spirit that makes him what he is. He approaches down. Now, the third part of the man is his spirit. And his spirit is in the center of his heart. And in the center of the heart is where God comes for the throne. Amen. You remember recently the, the papers given in Chicago about four years ago? When the old believer, old unbeliever rather, used to say that God made a mistake through Solomon when he said, as a man thinketh in his heart, said there's no mental faculties in the heart to think with. How could he think with his heart? Yes, he meant his head. If God would have meant his head, he'd have said his head. Like Moses. What if Moses, God would have said, Moses, take off your shoes, your own holy ground. He said, oh Lord, I just take off my hat. That's just as good. He said shoes. He didn't say hat. He said shoes. And when he said repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, he didn't mean Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He meant just what he said. When he said you must be born again, he didn't say you ought to be. He said these signs shall follow them. He never said maybe they will. He says what he means. And he's God and he can't take it back. He knows what's perfect, so he makes it that way. And that's the way he, he intends it to be. And you have to come up to that. Not him come down to your idea. You've got to come up to his idea. Amen. That's the difference. Now, now on this system of body, soul. Now, if you get the word soul and look it up, you'll tell you in the Bible dictionary or Webster, it is the nature of the spirit. Now, here's the man we say, here's John Doe. All right? John Doe and here's Sam Doe. All right? Now, um, John Doe is a man, body, he's a brother to Sando. Now, John is a spirit, soul, body. And Sando is the same thing, body, soul, spirit. You see, it's body, soul, spirit. Now, if this man is evil, mean, cheat, steal, lie, commit adultery, any evil thing that he can do, but this man is full of love, peace, joy, and they're both got soul, body, and spirit. Well, what's the difference? This man can go back and say, I remember my mama. I remember things that we done with his boy. Both of them can. They both got spirits. They both got souls. They both got body. But the nature of this man's spirit is evil. The nature of this man's spirit is good. Amen. See? So the nature of the spirit is the soul of man. Amen. See? So now God is trying to get into the what? The spirit and heart of man, where the spirit lays is in the heart. Amen. You know what science said is, I never finished that. That man couldn't think with his heart. 
And science begins to find out that there's a little compartment in the human heart, not an animal heart, but in the human heart there's not even a blood cell. There's nothing. They said it must be the place where the soul occupies, where the spirit. Just, just let them alone. <laughs> They'll take their own silly things and prove God. <laughs> That's right. God just makes the foolish testify of Him. Amen. Now, there it is. Big headlines in the paper. Brother Bull says, little girl said, Brother Bram, you know what you're saying the other day? He said, look, look, science has already found out. I said, well, bless God. I want that, sister. I want, I want that. The soul of man is the nature of the spirit, and the spirit dwells in the heart of man. Now, now, what is the outer courts? That's the flesh. See, that's the first thing you come to, the flesh. You've got to consume that first. You've got to pass beyond the flesh. I, I don't feel like getting up and going to church. The roads are too slick. I, I, it's too hot. Old church, I don't know. That's the flesh. All right. Now you've got to consume and walk through that. God has to get through that. The next time he comes, he has to come into the soul. That's the nature. Oh, what will the Joneses say about me? Oh, my, you know, my church will kick me out if I, if I do something like that, see? But you've got to walk through that. And when you walk through that, then he goes into the heart, and there's where he's thrown. That's the Holy Spirit in you. Jesus said, it'd be far better that a millstone was hanged at your neck, and you was drowned in the depths of the sea, and to even offend one of these little ones that believe in me. Amen. Not do them any harm, just even bring offense to them. Just upset them about something. It'd be better that you had your own self drowned or never been born on the earth than even to bring an offense to one. Did he mean it? Amen. Amen. Could he lie? No. Did the apostles say it? No. Amen. No. Jesus said it. Amen. Jesus said, if you even bring an offense to one of them, these little ones that believe in me, these signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. 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 Some great big folks say, well, I believe in him. Hallelujah. Have you ever spoke with tongues, interpret tongues, cast out devils, visions, and so forth, as he promised? No, that days are past. He's not a believer. He's a make-believer. Amen. Jesus said the last words he said, These signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. And all the world into every creature. That's right. They shall follow the believer until I return. That's the last words he said. How many knows that? Amen. The Bible is Mark 16. Now, see, he's a make-believer. But when you find a believer that really believes with signs following, and you see the humility of their life, not an impersonator, know that they are a Christian in a real genuine article, just keep still. They are to join right up with them and start moving along. Because you're moving right up the king's highway. Now, what happens? Watch this. Our courts was Luther's age as we started the body. Of the Gentile church. You remember, they were Jewish on, up to about the time of the, of the um, AD 606 when it came into Thyatira. It was nearly all Jewish converts. But after the Jewish, it dropped over in here. It's both Jew and Gentile, but mostly Jewish. But when it really come into the Gentile age, come this side. See? Come Martin Luther, John Wesley, and so forth. See? Now, watch these last three after that dark age come up to the middle age and pass over. When it comes, watch these outer courts. See? Flesh, soul, spirit. <laughs> the outer courts, the flesh, the holy place, Nazarenes, pilgrim holiness, free methods. See? And then holies of holies. Back into Pentecostal where it began at the beginning. See? Amen. Back to the beginning. Now, if you're drawing it out, I want to mark. Now there's five gates that goes into the flesh, that controls the flesh. You know that, isn't it? That's the five senses. How many senses control the body? Five. See, taste, feel, smell, hear. Is that right? That's the flesh. The outer courts. That's the things you can't depend on because it's flesh. The inner courts then. We have the inner courts, which is the next altar. And the next altar comes in, and it comes in with, um, with conscience, imaginations, memories, passions, and affections. That's the five senses that control the inner courts. That's the soul. Senses of affections, that's the soul. Love and so forth. And then the next uh, in this uh, sensor in here 
there would also be memories and conscience of mercy and so forth and, and um, an imagination. You sit down and imagine things. What do you do? You don't do it with your flesh. Your senses don't imagine. It's an inner court inside of you. It's got three gates. What are we doing? We're breaking now. Don't miss it. Coming from the flesh, the five senses, to the next, the soul, the inner courts. But now, you come into the heart. See? Now there's where you good pilgrim holiness and Methodists stayed on that altar out there. See? You're in the courts. You Lutherans and so forth, back in the flesh, back in with the five senses, what the eye can see and make out. See? Here come the pilgrim holiness, which was merely the free Methodist, come to the next courts and believe in holiness because it was called a holy place where the sacrifices laid. But once the year went the high priest into the holies of holies, which was condemned, there was the Lutheran age, then the Methodist age, then this age, the church lights coming, which is like in the system of the human being. Then how do, how do we get into this? Now remember, there was a veil a veil that hangs between the holy and the holies of holies. In the holies of holies is where Christ comes to set down on your heart's throne. Amen. Christ is enthroned. He comes through justification. Is that right? Amen. Sanctification. And then by one water, by one church, by one creed, by one Spirit. Amen. From here are we all baptized into one body. Amen. Which is the body of Christ by the what? Holy Spirit. Who comes in? Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostals, whosoever will. That veil, you know what that veil is? It veils your heart from it? Are you ready? The veil is called self-will. Amen. You get the picture now? Amen. The senses out there. The senses on the body. And the senses to the soul. And the veil between that and the holy place. The holies of holies. And the only way that you can get in there is to have self-will for whosoever... Will. What? Whosoever shakes hands. Whosoever is immersed. Whosoever joins the church, whosoever passes his letter, whosoever does it, no, whosoever will Amen. come beyond the veil. Amen. Let Christ come to the senses, say, well, I, ought, I don't want to go to hell, that's one thing, I'll join church, all right, Lutheran. Well, I'll tell you what, I believe I ought to live a different life while I can, sanctification at the altar. All right, Methodist. All right, man. Whosoever will, let him pass the ribbon veil. Oh, glory be to God. I'm on the other side. Hallelujah to his name. Amen. Oh, my. Whosoever will, let him tear down the curtains of his own will Amen. and let God come into his heart. Amen. There's Christ on his judgment seat Amen. in the human heart. What does that mean? You say, God said, oh, I, I can tell dirty jokes that don't condemn me. Why? They ain't got nothing to condemn. No one's there to, to take it out. No one's there to condemn you. Well, I'll tell you, the women say, I can have short hair. Don't condemn me. No wonder. See? Oh, I, I can wear short. I can do this. I man said, don't hurt me to smoke cigars. And it don't hurt me to play some... Um, some uh, cards and shoot some dice and whatever they do. Don't hurt me. They still belong to the church, see? Don't hurt me to do this. Why? Why? There's nothing there to judge you. Amen. But when Christ comes in, Amen. you've created an altar on your heart and your sins are taken daily. The great St. Paul Amen. said, I die daily. Yeah. Nevertheless, I live and not me, but Christ liveth in me. Yeah. There's the inner veil. Oh, brother, sister, hurry. I know. Oh, no, I'm, I just can't finish it. I'm past time. Let's see. Let me just. No, I better not. See, I'm going to take the 24 elders, and I know we're holding you all off from your dinner. We're just. Uh, let's see that. How many says take the 24 elders? 
Oh, just a minute. All right, just a minute. Twenty-four elders then. Let's get them right quick now. Around about the throne. And we're twenty around the throne. Now you see what where is the throne at now? In the heart. In the heart of who? The members of the seven church ages. Amen. Christ. Amen. Speak a word against their action, you're condemned. Amen. Amen. You'll answer for it in the day of judgment. And who will judge the earth? Saints shall judge the earth. Who did Daniel see coming with tens of thousands times ten thousands? The saints. Amen. The books were open. Sinners. Another book was open, which was the book of life, the sleeping virgin. Oh my, can't they see that? The sleeping church. Them that went out to meet the bridegroom and let the oil go out of the land, never entered into this. Never let Christ take control so He could work miracles and speak with tongues and do wonders and things to prove that He lived in this church. Yeah. What if Jesus would have come to earth and said, I'm Jesus. I'm the Son of God. Never done nothing. Just say, I, I'm going up here and join the church. Would that have been the Son of God? What did He say? If I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe me. Yeah. Oh my, do you see? God declares Himself. Yeah. He loves to. He's Jehovah. He likes to make himself known. Oh, I'm so glad of it. Yes, sir. He's made himself known to me. I know he has to you. Some of you young people just converted, yet you don't might not know him in the power and great things that the older Christians do, but you're coming right on into it. You're coming right up the King's Highway. Don't just keep looking and pressing as hard as you can. Run, run, run as hard as you can. Don't stop for nothing. Just keep on going. Like poor old sister Sally, you say, I'm running, running, running. I just got over. Running, running, running. I just got over. <laughs> run, run, running. You can't sit down. <laughs> Poor old soul. She's over there today. All right. Now, and there were, there were thrones, and uh, there's tw- there were four and twenty seats. Now, how many would that be? Four and twenty. Twenty-four. All right. Four and twenty seats. And upon the seat. Uh, Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders, one on a seat, clothed with white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now, the twenty and four elders, I want you to notice, they were not angelic beings. Angels are not associated, heavenly beings are not associated with crowns and thrones. See? See? They're never associated. They're angels. They never did overcome. If you notice a little later on the songs that they sang and things proved that they wasn't. See, they sung the song of redemption. So angels don't need to be redeemed. See? All right. But uh, they were redeemed men. I, you people, I ain't going to have time to catch this. Did you just write it down? If you want to know they were redeemed men, take Matthew nineteen twenty eight. All right, 1928, Matthew. Revelations 3.21. Then Ditto. Revelations 20 and 4. Revelations 2 and 10. 1 Peter 5. 2 and 4. 2 Timothy 4 and 8. That will let you know that they are redeemed. I want to go through that this morning. You see, you can just comb it for weeks, you see. They were not, they were not angelic beings. They were not heavenly beings. They were redeemed man. Amen. See, you can consider their dress the way they were dressed. You can consider their position, what they had. You can consider their songs, what they sang. And know that they were not angelic beings. Hmm. I hate to come to this, but let's read one more scripture, will you? All right, let's go back to Daniel 7. Just a moment back here. Daniel 7. And uh, just read a scripture here. So this is going to help you a whole lot in the rest of the message this morning. I'm sure that it'll make you feel a lot better after you read this. And see this, see what Daniel, the seventh chapter of Daniel. And let's begin now from the... Daniel 7, let's take uh, the ninth chapter, ninth verse. I listen close now to these th- things. And I beheld until the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garments as white as snow, 
and whose hair of his head were like pure wool, and his throne was like the uh, fiery flames. You see, again, come back to that amber fire. And his wheels as burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands times thousands ministered to him. And tens of thousands times ten thousands. There comes your redeem. Stood before him. And judgment was set. And the books, books plural, was open. Now, notice. This judgment was set. See, now watch. Daniel, when he saw the thrones at the judgment... They were empty. He seen thrones cast down, come down from heaven. The ancient of time came down from heaven. But when John saw it, the throne was already occupied by Jesus and the thrones for the disciples and the patriarchs redeemed was already fulfilled. See, Daniel saw it 500 years before the time of Christ and then after Christ makes 2,500 years and John was living over into the age that is to come and he had done seen all this happen where Daniel didn't see it. See, he just seen the ancient of time come. He saw him come, but when John saw him, the throne was filled. See, the thrones was cast down with the ancient of time and judgment was set. But when John saw him, the elders had not yet been chosen in the time of John a uh, time of Daniel, but is already redeemed at the end time. <laughs> He's on. Oh, Amen. Oh, isn't, that, isn't he wonderful? Oh, Daniel 7. He, uh, what did Daniel, Daniel do? He foresaw the judgment. Seeing the seated thrones was empty. See, they're supposed to be empty. As John in his time, after the raptured church, they were occupied by the redeemed elders. Hmm. What does an elder mean? If you take the word elder, i got about all these definitions wrote out here. I'm just skipping down. Elder means the head of a city or the head of a tribe. An elder. A head of something. Like, I, I be a, Brother Neville right now is an elder to this church. What is he? He's the head of this local body. See? And uh, the mayor of the city would be the elder of this city. See, the elder of the cities. You remember back in the Bible times, the elders of the city? Elder means the head of a city or the head of a tribe. Now, how many was he? Twenty and four. Twenty-four elders. Is that right? Amen. Now, oh my. Who was it? The twelve apostles and the twelve tribes of Israel. Amen. The twelve patriarchs. Now, we're going to take it right on down as we come into other lessons and prove that to be right. So I'm glad you're writing it down now. See, the twelve patriarchs and the twelve tribes of Israel. Now watch. Jesus said that Peter asked one day, he said, what will we receive? We have left father, mother, husband, wife, children, everything else. We've left everything. Peter said we've left our wives, we've left our children, we've left our father, mother, our homes and lands to follow you. He said, verily, verily I say unto you that you'll sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes. <laughs> There you are. That's the redeemed. The redeemed elders. Look look at David pro, pro, portraying Christ. See? When David was coming into power, the first thing, he had an awful time before he got into power. Yet he had the anointing on him. Amen. Yeah, the anointing was on him. And a lot of people thought he was just a little renegade. A little guy that was different, trying to tear up something. But does some man know that he was coming king? Amen. They stayed right with him. Hallelujah. Brother, I mean, you couldn't get him away from him. Amen. As he walked on. One day he stood up there on the mountain, looked down, seen his own little beloved city besieged by the enemy. And he stood there and remember when he was a little boy, he used to take sheep out through there and drink that water. It was real water. We spoke of it here not long ago, the waters of life. And there he used to think, I drank out of that. And his least desire was a command any man he had. Brother, two of those men grabbed their swords and fought through 15 miles of Philistines, Amen. chopping them from right to left to get him a drink of water out of that well. Amen. They know he was coming in power. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. One time, one of them to save him jumped into a pit and killed a lion single-handed. They were warriors. And one, when he came in power, you know what he done? He made each one of them a ruler over a certain city. Amen. See Christ there? He that overcomes shall rule over city. 
The overcomers. Today, when we see that He's coming in power, Christ will rule in this world. Germany and the United States and all must fall. Every nation must fall. The kingdoms of this world has become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ. And He will rule and reign on them. Right? We know He's coming in power. So the least of His desire is a command to us. He wants me to represent Him in a little bitty ten buck two where he ain't fifty cents of money where he ain't nothing to a poor bunch of people. That's a desire. Amen. Amen. You don't have to get so many. You don't have to do this to let me know He wants to go. Amen. Amen. That's all. If He wants me to do different, act different, like you sisters and things, if He wants me to do a certain thing, bless God, it's a privilege for me to do it. There you are. We know He's coming in power no matter what the world says. If I have to lay aside every weight and the sin does easily beset me, let me run with patience the race that's set before me. Let me look to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. Coming in power. That elders, the twenty and four elders... All right. Twelve over in Revelations, we find this. In the book of Revelation, about 21st chapter, we find that the city of Jerusalem had twelve foundations. Is that right? And he had twelve gates. That was three on each side. Three fours is twelve. Just exactly the way the tabernacle set in the wilderness for John said exactly and saw exactly the same thing that... Moses saw when he was up there. Same thing that Paul saw. And now, we notice that the twelve foundation were names of the apostles. And the twelve gates had a name of each tribe on the gate. How we look at that and see those twelve elders, the twelve tribes, the twelve apostles, the twelve foundations, the twelve gates. Oh, my Take them numerals of God and you can't miss it nowhere. She'll run right smack straight everywhere, every time. That's the reason, you see, we got these six days that the world has labored in and we're way up close to this seventh day now. The first 2,000 years, God destroyed the water, the world with water. Second 2,000 years, Christ come. This is 1961. Right at the door. Just a little time. Look, Jesus said, now it won't run all the way out. He said, because I'll have to cut the work short. Yeah. If I don't, the atomic bomb will destroy all flesh. Yeah. <laughs> For the elect's sake, I will cut the work short in righteousness. Yeah. Cut it off part of the time. See, then the thousand years millennium. The great day. While the church has labored against sin for 6,000 years. And the 7,000 is a millennium. Like God made six. Uh, uh, a thousand years to build the world and the seven thousand he rested from all of his works and the church labors against sin for six thousand years and the seven thousand the church rests. The white robes that was on the elders is the righteousness of the saints. The white means righteousness. And because they were robed showed they were priests or judges. White robed uh, priest judges Prophets, so forth. See what they were. They were white robed, the twenty and four elders. There will be twenty and four elders. There will be twelve of them for the twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve apostles for the church. And they sit in the courts of the great king. Remember, they're sitting out there. These are. And here is the bride and Christ sitting on his throne and his wife sitting by him, the church. Amen. The twenty and four elders, the hundred and forty four thousand eunuchs of the temple, ministering to him. Where he gets up, his wife goes with him. <laughs> My dude, that great age is coming. When all the sin and the resemblance of sins, all the big fine buildings that people are so cherishing today, all the money and lust and all the sin and uh, beautiful women and men and whatever they try to make their bodies something other to be a trap for the devil to send their souls into hell will perish and rot and skin worms will eat it up and first thing the skin worms all that they ever was will just go into a volcanic fire to return back to nothing but fall out and, and all volcanic ash but one of these mornings friend one of these mornings when that's all over she'll boom forth again Amen. The fields with its whitening clover 
And the, the fragrance off of the rose will blend in with the blossom off of the tree of life. And Christ will return in some morning. When the big birds, the doves will set the trees and coo, and there will be no more death and no more sorrow. Christ and his redeemed will return to the earth. Not old people, but young forever. Immortal will stand in his likeness. The sun and the stars will outshine. I'm bound for that beautiful city. My Lord has prepared for his own. Where all the redeemed of all ages will sing glory around the white throne. Sometimes I get homesick for heaven and the glory of you behold. What a joy that will be when my Savior I see in that beautiful city of gold. How I long to see him. Oh, I want to see him. I'm bound for that beautiful city. John saw it on the Isle of Patmos coming down as a bride adored for her husband. The glory of it I want to behold someday. I want to see him and look upon his face. Amen. There to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Tears all past home at last, ever to rejoice. The little slipping and sliding in the snow. The little heat and toil to the day. I wish my wife and Mabel would come forth and sing that song for me. <laughs> if I, I could, the toils of the road will see nothing. When I come to the end of the way. Yes, That's right. I remember the night when I left the church to start in the evangelistic work. When you all cried. None of them left hardly. Probably a few of you here. Sister and Brother Spencer. And maybe a, a few of the old timers left. When they cried here. But when the Holy Spirit said you must go. Now I remember my first meeting after being gone for months. Meeting come down to Jonesboro. Becky was a little bitty baby. Come down on the old cotton belt train. Take them days to get there. I stand out there when she come in that night. We tried to get to the auditorium. Three blocks away, the policeman was holding the streets like that. The streets was even packed. Had to take me through the streets and wind around to get into the place. Meaty said, did they come to hear you preach, Bill? I said, no. Then we sang, they come from the east and west. They come from the land afar to feast with our king, to dine as his guest. How blessed these pilgrims are, beholding his hallowed face, aglow with love divine, blessed partakers of his grace as gems in his crown to shine. Oh, Jesus is coming soon. Our trials will then be o'er. Oh, what if our Lord this moment should come for those who are free from sin? Oh, then would it bring you joy, our sorrow and deep despair. When our Lord in glory comes, Hallelujah. we'll meet Him up in the air. Amen. 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 Oh, I love Him. Amen. Would it bring you sorrow and deep distress? Or would it bring you joy? When our Lord in glory comes, we'll meet Him up in the air. Amen. With those thoughts on our mind, Let's bow our heads. Lord willing, I'll finish this service some other time. Our Heavenly Father, oh, they'll come from the east and west. They'll come from the lands afar. I'm thinking of that great rapture, the people I've preached to in Africa, Indian, around the world. How I'll see their face again. Many of them crying, going out the airplane, leaning across the fences and screaming and crying. I'm thinking when he went out with Paul one time, knelt down and they prayed. He said, I'm sure not of you, many of you here will see my face no more. But they'll come from the east and west. They'll come from the lands afar to feast with our king, to dine as his guest. How blessed these pilgrims are. Beholding his hallowed face in the emerald glory, a glow with light divine. Amen. Not just a lamp light or a candlelight, but, but divine light. A glow with light divine. 
Blessed partakers of his grace and gems in his crown to shine. Oh God, when the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure could be, when the voice of God said, Who will go for us? Then he answered, Here am I, send me. Oh, send the angel this morning. The cherubims with six wings as Isaiah saw them. Flying through the building crying, Holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. And Isaiah the young prophet said, I'm unclean lips and amongst unclean people. And my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. The pillars moved from the temple. And an angel took the tongs off the altar and got a coal of fire and laid it on his lips. Said, I'll clean your lips. Now prophesy, son of man. Send the angel this morning, Lord. Clean our lips from any violence. Clean our hearts and come in, Lord. Break down the self-will. That Let my will in thee be thy will, Lord. Oh, will thy will in me, O God. And let me in my church and my people be thine, O Lord. We commit ourselves to thee. And as the poet went on to say, Father, millions now in sin and shame are dying. Over in Africa, down in India, around the world. Thousands of hours meeting Him without knowing Him. Millions now in sin and shame are dying. Yet, God, it tears my soul to pieces to think of it. Listen to their sad and bitter cry. Hasten, brother, hasten to their refuge. Quickly answer, Master, here am I. Grant it, Lord. Grant it again. I made all kinds of mistakes, Father, through this past year. I pray you forgive me for them. And in this new year, Lord, anoint me afresh. Let me go to those millions sitting out there in sin and shame or dying. Bring them this great revelation of thy truth. Bring into them the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And on that day they might come from the east and west. Shining as gems in your crown. Help me, Lord. To go down and prospect and dig them out of the ground, the dirt of the earth. Amen. The dirt and filth that they're living in. Amen. And let them see a holy God that makes them clean up and live like Christians. Sanctified and pure before you. Turning away from evil, from all kinds of worldly amusements. And turning to a living God. Making them delegates of thy kingdom for that great day. Sanctify this little church this morning, Lord. Sanctify every person in here with thy spirit. And let the Holy Ghost come into their hearts. Each one of us. Freshen up the spirit in them who's already opened their hearts to their self-will. Has denied their own will and has come to know your will. Those young ones, Lord, many of them, just little babies. How you nurse them in your arms. How a mother takes care of her little one. Wiping the tears from their eyes and and, uh, giving them special things. Because she loves them. That's how you love your little newborn babes, Lord. They can't walk yet. They can't even talk. Only thing they can do is cry and look to Mama. Oh, God, hold them in your arms tenderly like little lambs and lead them. Until they become mature and they can walk. Then lead them, Lord, down to the paths of service. Granted, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Through Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I trust that the Lord has done something for you this morning to make you start the new year upon this one thing, that you love Jesus Christ. And someday you want to see Him and love Him and live with Him forever. It's my desire that not one of you will be lost, that every one of you will be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And be preserved until that day of His coming, because I believe it's soon at hand. Now, I turn the service back to Brother Neville.